everyone. Today, I have a special treat for you. Today, we have Steve. Quite possibly, one of the most intelligent people I know and I've ever met. And he has, uh, so I've worked with Steve before. He was the CEO of, uh, of the company that I worked for um, before he left. And uh, I learned different ways of problem solving, different ways of thinking. Um, and, uh, you know, without, uh, well, without tooting his horn anymore, <laughs> Steve, how you doing? I'm good, Josh. Thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm, uh, I'm excited. I know we, we don't chat as much as we need to. And, you know, you use the podcast as a way to bring us together. That's fantastic. Hey, absolutely. <laughs> right. And, you know, like everybody's got a story, you know, right. and I hate to say, you know, but like one of the driving factors behind this was some people I were going to have on here and they passed away. So their stories are no longer tellable, you know, yeah. and it's just, I, even if I'd never make a dollar on this, um, it's, it's worth it that way, you know, and it's Absolutely. just, yeah, it's just a way also because, you know, I'm stuck working at home and uh, all I talk to all day is pretty much the dog in the car <laughs> and sometimes the dog talks back. So, you know, this, then was, you know, you need something else to do yeah, at, the, at that moment. This was for me to keep my health. <laughs> um, so why don't you go ahead? And, so, tell us what was like to go to grow up in uh, in the Soviet Union, where it was real communism, and uh, you know most of the people that um, were around during then, which who lived in the USSR, you know they're getting older. Those stories are, you know, going away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, paint the picture for us. I appreciate it, Josh. Yeah. So, just you know, quick background. I was born in Kiev, Ukraine. And ended up emigrating from there to the U.S. when I was about seven. And so my stories, I always think back, how much of it do I actually remember? And how much of my memories have been told to me by my family? Like, do you remember when we did this or that, right? But there's definitely some interesting stories that I remember that I'll, that I'll share. Um, to start out with, um, growing up in the Soviet Union as a Jewish family was in itself a very interesting thing. We, you know, we take a lot of things for granted that we don't think about in this country. We can live where we want, we can do whatever we want, we could study what we want, we can find whatever job we think we're qualified for and, and go pursue that. We can buy the things that we want, we can travel, we can make our own decisions. Every single one of those things that I just mentioned was not a reality growing up as a Jewish family in the Soviet Union. Just think about how crazy that is in in its totality. So my parents were only allowed to go to certain schools. When they were ready to pursue their higher education, they were only allowed to pursue certain majors. I couldn't even tell you why, like it just felt so random. And so my father tells me a very interesting experiences going through the army because all men had to serve. It was mandatory. Mm -hmm being a Jewish person in the army. They treated him like crap. They would have him go fetch stuff for people. It was just in every aspect of society, that's just how it was. And then just as a society overall, you could travel within the region you lived in for most people. Almost no one owned a car because nobody was paid enough money to own a car. And so probably the best way to describe the Soviet Union keep everybody so anxious and working that they don't have time to think about their condition. And as long as wow. you could do that, I mean, I feel like some of that exists in some countries today that have that regime, Cuba, North Korea, mm -hmm. when you're just focused on your basic survival, you don't have time to think that maybe we should have a different, different political system, that maybe we should try to change things. You're just thinking, I have to work, Oh, wait a second, I got to go and get in line to buy bread. Oh, wait a second, we don't have vegetables. Those are only available on Wednesdays at a market that's an hour away. I got to go get there or I won't have vegetables. I mean, that's how crazy society is. I mean, like when we think about food and we talk about how we have food inequality in this country, I'll give you a crazy example of food inequality. Not only were, was military service mandatory, Everyone had to take a month off of work, every person, and go pick fruits and vegetables at a collective farm. Wow. You could be an engineer, you could be a janitor, you can be a plumber, you can be a lawyer. Didn't matter. One month a year, 
you were all in those fields supposedly picking and packing fruits and vegetables to be loaded and brought to the cities. And so I hear from my parents all the time, food scarcity in the city, produce rotting in the fields. Because what incentive do you have as a lawyer, doctor, plumber to do agricultural work? That's not what you were interested in doing. It's not the career choice you made. The government just said, you go do that, so we'll kill your family. So that's, that's that simple. <laughs> but then also, you're when you're, uh, when you're picking in the fields, you're not allowed to like pocket one and like bring it home or no, anything. And- no, so instead... If you needed to pick 20 things, you'll pick five. So nobody could say you didn't pick anything and you leave the rest rotting. And now there's only five things instead of 20 that make it to the city. Now there's not enough produce in the stores in the city and everybody's queuing up just to buy those tomatoes. Just think about how ridiculous that system is, right? Whereas the whole premise of communism was supposed to be that regardless of who we are, we both have the same things. We're both equally comfortable in whatever that means. But... I don't think there's ever been an implementation of true communism. It's always turned into a small percentage of the people get whatever they want. And everyone else is just a mindless lemming. Just you're, you're like in the matrix. Well, that's that's kind of, it kind of speaks on human nature, right? Because uh, humans aren't really capable of um, being a collective like that and being equal. There's always going to be somebody that figures out a way to get a little bit more Right. And then they share that with their friends and they get a little bit more. And then by the time that's, you know, a little collective of them, it's shat on so many other people that they don't get anything, <laughs> you know, and that's just, that's just, there's no way around that unless yeah. we become not people. That's right. You're right. I mean, human nature is some want more and some don't want more and you can't tell everyone that they should have the same, yeah. right? It just doesn't seem to work. But I don't even think they tried to tell everyone <laughs> the same. I mean, I'll, I'm just going to share some more interesting examples with you. So I mentioned a lot of strictness about where you travel, what kind of education you can have, where you can work, how much they paid you to keep you just enough, but not too much. Most people lived in apartments and it wasn't just, well, I'm going to rent a one or two or three bedroom apartment. Apartments were measured by number of rooms, not number of bedrooms. <laughs> so people didn't say I live in a two bedroom they would say, I live in a two-room apartment. Because guess what? You can put beds in any room. (laughs) And so what would happen, and not only that, but they made housing a shortage artificially. They didn't build extra housing. So let's say you grew up, maybe you got married, you wanted to live somewhere with your new wife. You didn't. You lived with your parents because there was nowhere to go and you didn't have money to even get an apartment, let alone have anyone actually allocate one for you. So everything was done out of bounds on the black market. You wanted an apartment, you had to go find some other people, money had to change hands, somebody somewhere, someone had to move from here to here, or somebody had to lie and fill out on a form that that apartment was allocated for some other government purpose, and you got to live there. Like nothing was normal, right? And so everything was tied to this, like I mentioned, the collective farming, everything was uh, around this concept of a planned society. My grandmother was what they called an economist. So she was, you know, well-educated, you could argue. She grew up in a tiny little village, grew up through World War II, just a terrible situation, but got an education. And her job was to plan uh, commercial output. So she was in charge of a certain district, some number of factories. Her job was to determine the factory's capacity and provide them target plan numbers. You need to output this many pairs of pants, this many jackets, this many pairs of shoes, because everything was planned. But within that system, as I mentioned to you, everything was out of bounds black market. So if you were the, the, the plant the manager and I was my grandmother, I would determine what your true capacity of output is And together we'd decide that on the plan, we'd put like 80%. The other 20% you would produce, we would sell to the side and we would split the money. Ah, the old third shift. The old third (laughs) shift, right? But that's what everyone had to do Mm -hmm. because there was no other way to get ahead. There was no other way. How how are you going to get that apartment? How are you going to get a little extra money to take a vacation? Vacation. I have these incredible memories of a, as of, a, of a child. We would go from the big city, and Kiev was a pretty good-sized city, probably 
three to five million population, you know, a decent sized city. We would go and stay at this little vacation house, is how my brain remembers it, on the river, the beautiful river that you can swim in. Well, as I got a little bit older and I learned more about what my dream vision of what I thought that vacation house is, it was essentially barely a barn. <laughs> there was no running water or electricity or refrigeration. <laughs> really? We had to, there was a hole in the ground and you put your potatoes and other things in the hole to keep it cold because it got hot. The river was there. I did, in fact, swim in the river. I played on a little sandy beach. But what my vision of this dacha or this vacation home that we went to for a month in the summer was so different than what I thought in my mind it was. Because, we, I mean, when you were there, when you were a kid playing, it was probably like the greatest thing. Of course. Of and, course. And like, I didn't back, care about the fact that it literally was like a barn fit for cows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, I remember, Josh, I remember as a child, my friends and my wife think I'm out of my mind that I totally made this up, but I swear I did not. I remember milking a cow and drinking the milk from the pail. Really? Yeah. At least you used a pail. I, at least I used a pail. <laughs> I did not milk the cow right into my mouth. But I mean, it was just, life was very simple. And I guess if you look at all the things that you could say about it that maybe weren't great, and you have to look at at least some parts of it that you, you can look at and say, well, what were the positives? Mm -hmm. Life was simple. Yeah. Life was routine. It was difficult, but it was simple. Like my grandparents lived in this huge building. I don't know, maybe 10 story building. And they were like on the sixth floor. And I would sometimes get to go on their balcony and look down across a busy street and see people walking. And it was really pretty in the winter time. In their backyard, it was like these traditional huge housing complexes. Now we call them projects, right? <laughs> but the backyard would have like a huge soccer field. And in the summer, you know, again, I was a little kid, but I would go and kick a soccer ball around. In the wintertime, there would be a hockey stadium. And I would go and, you know, skate around and play a little hockey as a kid. Like, so those are like really, really nice memories. I didn't go to school. I left right at the age I was supposed to start school, but my family realized that we wanted to emigrate and they decided not to put me into the school. Oh. You know, so I, I, I missed, when I came to this country, I was sick for a little while, I guess. So I started school the second half of second grade, missed kindergarten, first grade, and the first half of second grade, just based on age. Oh, well, um, it worked out for you. I guess so. <laughs> I mean, you know, they say everything you learn in life, you learn in kindergarten. So I did miss that part. <laughs> but I mean, in a way, like you had a better education as far as being close to the earth, being... Yeah. Having to be responsible for your own food, knowing where it comes from, knowing the value of hard work. Yeah, um, it's true. And the undervalue of hard work. Appreciation. Like, I think that's the silver lining. You learn to really appreciate things because you have so little. Right. right? And I think that's great because in this country, it's really hard to appreciate things. Right. Some it, of absolutely. us do, but it's hard, right? Our kids... They want an iPhone when they're young or an iPad. They want a pair of Nike sneakers because that's what they see their friends wearing or a pair of Levi's jeans or some cool hoodie. But everything is around, I want, I want, I want. You don't necessarily go, you know what? That's the hoodie I'm going to have for four years. Right. And that's the only hoodie I'm going to have. Whereas in Russia, literally, that would be the only jacket you would have. God forbid you forgot it or left it or, or, or ripped or tore it, right? So you took better care of things. You know, here, if you rip your socks, how many people do you know that actually fix them, right? It's very, very rare. Mm -hmm. Typically, you rip them, maybe you wear them for a little while until you realize they, the hole is too big, <laughs> and then you throw them away. Yeah. We've repaired socks because there wasn't a place to easily go buy another pair, right? So it's all mm. of those little things, which I think it probably fundamentally makes you the person you become because of those, you know, the influence of that on your life. You start to appreciate things a little bit more. You think about things a little bit more. You think about the value of things, right? Like we can buy a lot of things for our kids, but I'm constantly thinking about making sure that my kids are doing something that they're going to appreciate later. Like, oh, you need to work. You know, obviously you've met my kids. My youngest is working uh, in the warehouse in one of the companies that you work at. And at the same time, he and his friend wash cars, hmm. you know, and they're just working really hard and they understand the value of making money. And I think that's the value of having things and to be able to get things. Right. 
I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges and differences in how I grew up over there versus how a lot of kids grow up here. Yeah. I mean, I know that for me, it's hard to kind of instill that with my kids. And it's not like, oh, well, we can get another one, you know, and like that. Yes, we can get another, but that's <laughs> not, that's not the attitude to have, you know? And that's so right. like, just because you said that now that money's coming out of that, bo- that bucket of change you have, you know, because yeah. it, it, like they have to pay for, you know, it, not that she really did a whole lot of work to earn it because he just collects change and throws it in there. But, you know, I mean, when the ice cream man comes, they got to pay for it themselves. And, you know, they're only eight and three, but um, there's so many kids that just, that I see that just don't give a shit. They leave things and they step on things and they don't take care of their, their toys, their clothes. I mean, and it's kind of hard, right? Because, my my oldest daughter will come home with like holes in her pants because she's sliding around or and I, I don't want to tell her not to like do that because she's yeah, a kid, you know, right. and that's kind of where I have to tell myself to draw the line. Like, don't tell her to take care of her clothes so much because she's going to grow out of them in eight months, six months anyway. That's true. You know, so that's true. you have to balance that, if you will. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what's wild is the. uh what you mentioned about it being a luxury to think outside of survival. Yeah. You know? I mean, it really is. And, and one, one other thing I didn't mention, Ash, you lived with the fear that if you had a little more than your neighbors and they would get envious, they could accuse you of something and report you to the government for something that may appear subversive. And then all of a sudden, you know, we've seen it in movies, literally, somebody would show up at night and take somebody away. So you're wow. literally living in this weird, but you know, that was the genius, right? Of what they created is you and I, if one of us accumulated something, we couldn't even talk to the other person and say, look at this thing I have. Look at this nice trip I took. Look at this nice article of clothing for fear that your envy would have you report me or you would tell your wife or your friend and they would get envious and report me. And I would just be taken away for something made up about, you know, some subversive thought I had about the government. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it really is genius because you have people policing each other. That's right. You, you know, don't, you don't need, you don't need anything else. Right. Yeah. I mean, they were, I mean, that's kind of what China's trying to do with their like listening and their that's monitors, right. but the USSR did it old school style. Like it was genius. Right. I mean, literally like when you think about, it, you want to control a society, convince them that any person's allowed to report on any other person. And remember, because our lives are so shitty in so many other ways, knowing that I have the power to report on you, as disgusting in some ways as that may be, gives me some weird thrill. Because it gives me some lever of control that I don't have in my own life. Right. As terrible as that is. No, I could see that. (laughs) I mean, it it is, but... I. That's again, that's kind of human nature, you know, like you cling, you got to have to kind of cling to whatever power you get or whatever, what you can exert on people because everybody knows it. If, if, uh, the roles were reversed, they would do it to you. That's the mentality, right? That's the terrible mentality. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's hopefully I think for your listeners and your viewers, we're painting a very interesting picture of like, what does that actually mean? Right. You could talk about communism and you can talk about this big military industrial complex, but like, what does it mean in the day-to-day life of an individual, whether you're a kid or an adult? It means you're regular living in anxiety. If you and I get together, maybe, I don't even remember because I was so small, I'm assuming sometimes people maybe went out to a restaurant or a bar, but most people didn't have a lot of money, so probably they got together either at a park or at each other's two-room apartment. Yeah. <laughs> but imagine we get together how guarded we have to be. We're drinking together. We're talking about family. God forbid politics. Yeah, you, right? you cannot talk about politics. Think about that. Think you about cannot that. talk about vacation. You cannot talk about... Anything that would even remotely maybe make the other person feel less than you and make them angry enough to want to exercise that lever they have. So imagine how uncomfortable that would be. I mean, you would hope that your close friends and your family would not do that. And so I'm sure people opened up and maybe sometimes they got screwed for it. But imagine the back of your head, 
every day of your life when you're not at work and you're supposed to be relaxing and hanging out with your family and friends, you have this other thing hanging over your head. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> it's heavy. <clears throat> that's a tough way to live. It's a tough way to live. And I mean, look, they kind of still live a little bit like that, right? From what I understand, and I'm not an authority on how it is today, but you know, everything we see in the news, like you disagree with the way they're doing things over there, you probably want to keep it to yourself. <laughs> Right. I just, I mean, it obviously has, because everybody that I meet that's from Eastern Europe, there's a certain kind of resilience to them. You know, like not, not necessarily the people that were born here, yeah. but the ones that came over, you know, and like there's a drive to do better. There's a, uh, there's um, a, some like a, almost seems like a fear of stagnation. Yeah. You know, right. and uh, it's, Maybe I'm envious of that, you know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm envious. Maybe I'll report you for that. Yeah, there, yeah. Listen, you know, please uh, <clears throat> don't sign your name to it, <laughs> um, because I will report you right back. <laughs> but it's just, it's uh, you know, you. It, it's just interesting because it's so different than what we have today, and you know, so when you when you left, it was probably it couldn't have been that much longer than the Soviet Union fell. It was, yeah, it was rel relatively short period of time. It was, in, you know, in number of years. I, I came to the U.S. in 1980, so I don't remember exactly when. I, mean, I guess it took a little bit of time, right? It was late 80s, right? I forget when, when the wall fell and, you know, some of those things. But relatively speaking, fairly quick, right, yeah. after that. But, I mean, even just, uh, so last piece of leaving that, just even leaving was extremely difficult. I don't know how long it took to get a visa, we, my family didn't have the money to leave my parents. My grandparents saved the money in order to facilitate leaving. We were allowed one crate, decent sized crate. Think of it as almost like a mini storage locker, but that can be transported. Mm. And that's all we were allowed to take with us. Plus, you know, whatever, some personal belongings, you know, backpack or purse or whatever. But you had to f put your life into a crate. Was it, uh, did you guys come here on a boat or was it, you, were you flying? Well, the, the story of that in itself is hilarious. We took a train from Kiev to somewhere in what was then Czech, Czechoslovakia, which is now Czech Republic and, and Slovakia. Then somehow, I couldn't tell you how, I think maybe another train. We went to Vienna and I think we were only in Czechoslovakia for a day maybe. Went to Vienna. We lived there for one to two weeks. I remember seeing bananas for the first time in my life. Had never seen a banana before. The whole family over ate bananas and got sick because we'd never <laughs> seen them and they were so delicious, right? We're yeah. like, oh my God, look at this magical thing. Whoa, whoa, you know, like, oh, wow. Then we, I think, took another train to Italy and we lived outside Rome, I think in a smaller town called Sebastopol or something like that for over a month or maybe even a couple of months while we applied or continued our application process for a refugee visa to come to the US. And then eventually we got on a plane in Italy and flew to San Francisco. Only after my parents' friends, so we didn't go to the East Coast where we had a bunch of family, I don't remember why, but my parent had, parents had some friends that came before us. They vouched to be our sponsors, which basically means they were financially responsible for us when we came to the U.S. so that we wouldn't be a burden to the country. Oh, oh is, that, is that still a thing? I mean, if you want to come to this country and I, you know, having come through all of that, like it sure as heck should be, right? I don't know if obviously everybody, I mean, I'm sure the ones running through the fences down south <laughs> probably are, well, they don't get to bring a crate. So in all fairness, they're not bringing a whole crate, <laughs> right? But there's nobody vouching for them. Sure. Right? They are going to be a financial burden, mm -hmm. or some of them will be, right? We came to this country with the crate. So some little things that we were going to use and maybe some th things we thought maybe we could sell. I think we sold a few little things in Italy. And then there was some group that lent us some money that we had to pay back. And I think we started life in the U.S. with like 800 or or $1,000, you know, and then whatever we brought over in the crate. <laughs> Wow. So the, so the, the crate was, was that living with, with you in Vienna and Italy and you know what? That's a good question. I honestly don't know what that whole process was like as a child. Like I don't, I just remember that there was a crate. I have this vivid memory of it. 
because we had to figure out what fits in there and what we have to leave behind. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason I remember it. But how the crate actually followed us, <clears throat> it must have. Because I remember we sold some stuff in Italy. So some part of whatever was in the crate, I think I remember selling. I think we brought some little tchotchka, some you know Soviet watches or something silly. In fact, oh. my dad was reminding me the other day, there were some watches on a table and somehow he put his own watch there. And as a kid, I didn't know any better. So I grabbed them all and I sold them, including his watch. <laughs> was he pissed? At that time, probably, <laughs> yes. But to this day, he says, you were a born salesman. <laughs> I, that's true. I, <laughs> you sold the watch right off your old man. Sold my watch right off his wrist, man. Just slipped it right off, yeah. Jeez. So, so it, was, it was an interesting story coming here, you know, after the relations got better and the Soviet Union fell apart and you get on a plane and fly and come here and, you know, you still need somebody to financially take responsibility for you, which makes sense. I mean, why should we, the taxpayers, just pay for anybody that wants to come here? Sure. Right? If we're working hard, my expectation is if someone else comes here, maybe we can set them up with some money as a loan, but they need to get a job, they need to work hard and they need to pay that money back and that could fund the next person that could come here. Sure. Right. I mean, yeah. Sadly, I don't think that's how it works. But in a dream, in a dream, I would, I yeah. would expect that that would be the way. To yeah, I, I guarantee that's not how it works. That's not how it works. <laughs> no, I mean, unfortunately, everyone's finding all the loopholes. Right. Well, that's what it's all about, right? I mean, it's just it, it, once somebody. I, I, so I, it, kind of on a, ta- a tangent here, but finding loopholes is kind of part of business now. Yeah. You know, it, I, yeah. I, I, I'm going to bring it back to sports, but yeah. like you look at the A's. Um, the owner of the A's has found a loophole. You know, he has a small market team that gets subsidized by larger market teams like the Giants and the Yankees. He pockets the money, doesn't use it to to get um, better players, and is somehow still going to be able to get a new stadium in Las Vegas. It's unbelievable. You know, you know and it's, it's it's hard to understand. It's a loophole that he's found, and I mean that's you kind of. And the mentality of that is not like, this is the wrong thing to do. This is every man for himself. Anybody else in my position would do the same thing, you know? And people have lost a lot of that morality of just, it's just the wrong thing to do, you know? You're right. You're right. I mean, there's just so many of these social things now Mm -hmm. that are just hard for the average person to understand. Yeah. I was talking to my sister about all the homelessness we see now, and it somehow feels more visible, right? I mean... Mm -hmm. Is there truly more people homeless than there was 10, 20 years ago? I don't know. I honestly, you know, I've never studied it. I'm assuming that perhaps because we've had some pretty bad drug epidemics, right? So you have to assume maybe a slightly higher percentage of the population got caught up in drugs and, you know, because of that lost everything and is living on the street, right? Regardless of their situation. But, you know, we live in certain neighborhoods and all of a sudden, you know, we're starting to see people pull up in those RVs and those things that you and I remember from when we were working <laughs> down in, in the in the stretches of San Francisco, but yeah. people parking these RVs in residential neighborhoods mm-hmm. and just planting themselves there. And not just the fact that, you know, maybe the people that are living in that neighborhood are paying X amount to rent or to buy a home there, like that's not fair, but these people are dangerous on top of it. Right. So, and, yeah, I mean, and we don't do anything be. about it. And yeah. So, you know, you question like, how's that happen? If you and I park our cars somewhere in three days, it's going to get towed. Yeah. So we are held accountable to a certain standard and a homeless person in an RV, which is going to be bigger than the average car, is going to plant themselves and live somewhere and nothing happens. It makes yeah. no sense, right? To your point about loopholes, clearly there is a loophole of mm-hmm. some sort. <laughs> yeah, well, I think so. I think that particular issue has to do with it can also be uh, that RV can be claimed as a residence. I guess right. Like guess with so. ours, what we need to start doing is like get a whole bunch of sweatshirts and stuff, and like old socks, and strew them around our car so it looks like we live in it. There we go, and then our car can sit there for as long as we want. Then you're good, you know. But free free parking in <laughs> uh, in tight neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, but I actually, so I had a couple of guys on here that were crime scene cleanup guys, and they deal a lot with homeless people. And, you know, they get to know them on like a personal basis almost. And so, you know, they go into the camps, clean up the camps, take the trash away, things like that. But it's really, it's it's a whole other society. You know, they're, they have basically like their mayor or their, you know, the person that's in charge of, you know, this region 
you know? And it's just, <clears throat> it's a whole aspect of a different society that we only see on a surface level, you know? And these, like, they are most of the time looking for their next fix, you know? And just li- okay living in squalor in you know, living in their filth. And eventually the crime scene cleanup guys will come and take their trash away. You know, and it's just, wow. it's a wild, it, it's, I don't know how you fix that. I don't think we had that in Russia. Now that I think about it, I mean, there must have been people homeless. I mean, I, you would think, but somehow they weren't visible. So it makes you wonder that they just get sent up to the gulags in <laughs> Siberia. And I mean, seriously, right? Yeah. Like, because I think back, you know, again, as a kid, it's hard to remember. There may have been, right? I mean, in all fairness, it probably wasn't zero. But I don't remember those kinds of issues, you know? And it's just, it's interesting. And I don't know if that's just our society and what we find is acceptable, right? Because somehow we make decisions as a society that allows these things to happen. Mm-hmm. We can complain all we want, but somehow the actions we take, this is the result of those actions. It doesn't happen on its own, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you guys probably didn't have a huge drug problem over there either, right? Not, I don't believe there was a huge drug problem. I mean, I'm sure there was drug dealers and all the normal things, but a tremendous alcoholism problem. Tremendous. Uh. You know, we, we joke, but in Russia, you know the way they open a vodka bottle? They pop it the way you do a beer. It's not a screw top. <laughs> Just think about that. What does that imply? Yeah. That implies that when you open it, you don't put it away for later. Yeah. That's a one-time use thing. It's a one-time use thing. So think about that. So there was definitely tremendous amount of alcoholism in society, which kind of makes sense when people's lives were so miserable. Where else could you escape? You escaped into a bottle because when you were drunk, you were in a different reality and you didn't have to think about how difficult or terrible your life was at the moment. Right. I mean, also in some parts... Uh, it gets so cold that vodka is pretty much the only thing that won't freeze. That's right. That's right. It was definitely used for heat. I mean, my dad has really good stories from the army that they would drink to stay warm. Mm-hmm. Abs- absolutely. But yeah, it was it was a terrible, terrible problem with alcoholism in the Soviet Union. I think culturally, and I don't know what started it. I'm sure there's probably some historical background to it. But for as long as I've ever read about different parts of its origins and the history of the Soviet Union and Russia, alcoholism has always been a predominant issue. Huh. Does that have anything? So I noticed in, in that culture, they have, they put their bottles, what they put them under is the seat on the ground. Yeah. Do you know what's the reason? I know what you're saying. It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know the specific reasons. Like I said, I know that when they open them, they typically don't close them. (laughs) Um, I got to imagine maybe there's a little bit of territorialism, like my bottle versus your bottle. Although communal drinking is still obviously very big. So I don't know the history of that one. That's an interesting one. I was not as familiar with that. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I think about it, I think I do. I just don't remember being, I, I don't remember knowing about it as much. If that right. makes sense. Right. So, I mean, if I, um, if I remember correctly, you know, Ukraine has a huge Jewish population, right? It did. And I think it sort of still does now. Apparently there's some really, really well-known rabbi that's from the Ukraine where like religious people, even from Israel, it's almost like pilgrimage to Ukraine to see this rabbi. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's literally apparently flights where it's like all Orthodox Jewish people flying between Israel and Ukraine, like that level. I don't know why in Ukraine specifically, but yeah. Yeah, because it, it, was, it was weird to me. It's like, I, th- I think I read somewhere that, um, they, that Ukraine has the highest per capita of Jewish people, other than obviously Israel. It's, it's, it's probably true. I think you're right, even though life was difficult, right? And they try to push Jewish people out and there was a lot of persecution. Somehow they just persevered. You know, like one of the things, and this wasn't during the Soviet Union, this was pre-Soviet Union, but my grandmother remembers when she lived in a little village and I assume at that time, it was a Jewish village. Probably like all Jews or almost all Jews, right? Versus a Christian village or whatnot. But, you know, you've heard of pogroms, which, the you know, the the czars would send 
their military and they would go and trash a village. Sometimes they would rape or kill people or set their homes on fire, basically to torment them and make their life more difficult. It wasn't to the level of expelling them from where they lived to somewhere else. And I'm sure, you know, to some degree that happened, but it was literally to torment people. Pre-Soviet Union, but I think when it went from Tsarist Russia into the Soviet Union, some of those underlying ways of how they thought about things didn't just go away. Right. You know what I mean? I think that's why there was built-in persecution for Jewish people in the communist Soviet system. I mean, that was... It was like, I could almost imagine somebody sat down and wrote laws, and they're like, uh, Jewish person? Not Jewish person. Okay, here's your path. Here's, I mean, seriously, like wow. decision trees. You know what I mean? I, I, it probably wasn't that sophisticated, but it almost felt like it was. Well, I mean, it probably it probably wasn't like planned out on paper, but no. the nature, it you know, people want to separate people and other people, you know, like that's they right. want to paint them as an other. That's right. You know, and that's, I can see that happening. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, that kind of, um, it's, it's, it's ironic, right? Because that has a massive Jewish population, but, you know, one of the reasons that um, Putin invaded Ukraine was because he said that there was Nazis there, you know? And um, I actually had somebody on the show a, a while ago. He was uh, in the Russian military and he oh, wow. defected and came over here, right? I don't, I don't think he defected because he didn't join our military, but, you know, he, he escaped. Escaped, yeah. Right? And he was telling me that, you know, if he was driving a truck or a tank and the headlight goes out, you got to you gotta go to the parts store, you got to buy it, you don't get paid back kind of thing, you know? Wow. But... Um, he was saying that it was a um, a denazification, which is a word that we don't really use at all here, right? No, but it's I've very never heard of that word. That means we should go into whatever parts of the U.S. where we have white supremacists. Yeah, theoretically, right. We should invade, right? <laughs> Based yeah. on that principle. Yeah, and, well, that's that's the logic, right? Yeah. That was the reasoning yeah. that he said, and you know, there's all there's other things of you know we move too far, move, move NATO too far yeah. to the East, which possibly, sure, you know, but, um, I mean, I think it's even worse now because the Baltics and, and Finland, all of those right. countries now are right on the border with Russia and all sitting with American weaponry now. Yeah. I mean, Finland has a, a massive border with Russia. I was just reading that like thousands of kilometers. Yeah. Y yeah. And it just seems like, um, for some reason, it just seems like this war is, it's like, nobody cares about Ukraine. You know, like... It's a weird situation. I agree with you. I mean, like, we talk about, let's give them weapons the way we would talk about, where should we go out for dinner tonight? Right. It's, you know, it, sometimes it feels like that nebulous versus, to your point, what is the actual goal? Right. And I don't think anybody wants to talk about that because I think if we talk about it, that we'd be making a public stand that the goal is to defeat Putin. And nobody wants to actually say that, right? To your point. Mm -hmm. So instead, we just take these various actions, right? Like I wanna, I don't know, I wanna evict you out of a home that I own that you live in. And I don't, I don't ever actually say to you that I wanna evict you, but I do all of these annoying yeah, things. Like you'll turn the water off for a day so That's you don't right. have any hot water. That's you'll right. turn the power off for a day to just make your life shitty. That's almost what it feels like, right? And I think the equivalent of that is we'll send some weapons, then we'll hold some weapons back, then we'll send some more weapons, then we'll put some sanctions on some people, then we'll freeze some of their money. You know what I mean? Like these constant, but we're not willing to say what we're trying to accomplish. Right. Well, we know- We're afraid. We're afraid right now, I think, to say it for whatever we're, reason. Well, we're a hair away from World War III, right? The yeah. factions are there. Yeah. The factions are there. It's Iran, North Korea, China, and Russia. And, you know, versus, you know, NATO and, you know, Australia and Japan and stuff. Yeah. But like, the factions are there and everybody is gearing up. You know, and the temperature's not 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 going down anywhere. You no. know, like, and this year in particular, um, I think three quarters or maybe more of the world is voting on changing their you know uh, political system or a new president, new prime minister, yeah. whatever. You know, and that's a it's it's going to be some results out of that. Well, that's such a massive change either way, especially 
considering the climate, you know, and everybody's on edge. And it seems like Ukraine's almost being used as like a testing ground for weapons, you know, and it's just, well, what, what, what else has Putin got? What's he got out there? You know, when's he going to bring the Su 57s out? And it's like, well, he's waiting for us to bring the F 22 Raptors out. And it's just like, it, it, everybody's fighting now with their like basically still Soviet stuff and still, and our old stuff is what we give to Ukraine. We of don't, course. you know, cause we, we don't say, want to release any of our new stuff. Well, we say we give them $60 million, but really we give them $60 million of our old stuff that we would have written off anyway, that we would have written off anyway. And we give that 60 million taxpayer dollars to like Boeing or Raytheon or general dynamics. And they build us some new shit. That's right. You know, and it's just a lot of people don't like we don't just give money to them and they're like, oh, great. Thanks. You know, it's like here's 60 billion dollars worth of, or 60 million worth of scrap metal of. Well, it's still usable. Right. Know, but it's I like, know. you know, you those would technically have expired. You know, the explosives and shells, mm -hmm. you have to use them or you lose them. Yeah. And it seems like that's it's it's somewhat of a dumping ground, you know. And And, and, and sadly, even with that. The great Putin army <laughs> is stumped. But that's the funniest thing about all of it. To your point well, about we're like playing whack-a-mole with what was supposed to be categorized as this major military power that literally is getting bonked around. Well, which is just ridiculous. They so Ukraine is getting our old shells, but Russia's getting North Korea's old shells. I know. So it's like, you know, some of them are filled with water. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I, I will say, I will suggest the only reason I think we don't escalate too much beyond this is, and you're going to probably laugh, China can't afford <laughs> to go to war with the U.S. because their whole economy is built on producing shit we buy. Yeah. Literally. And we can't afford to go to uh, war with China because who's going to make our t-shirts and our underwear and, and every basic thing that we use to mm -hmm. live? And who's going to buy our trash? That's right. Because we send a bunch of our recyclables and trash over there. And, and the ironic thing is that they will take our trash, dump it, and use it to make those um, like the artificial islands that they have that yeah. they put little military bases on. And it's like, what are we even doing? Yeah, it's, it's kind of... I mean, it's just funny because it's just so much ego and chest pounding and rhetoric. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, aside from Russia, Iran, and North Korea, all these other countries need each other. Venezuela that goes and says all this dumb shit, like they need to sell their oil to someone. Russia's not going to buy all their oil. Yeah, well, North Korea can't buy all their oil. So they still need to sell oil to other people or, or they'll all die and starve to death. So it's like, there's only a few countries that don't care about their people starving and dying. Yeah, That's well, North Korea. Russia and Iran. Venezuela? <laughs> yeah, I feel like extent. they're on the border, right? I feel like they'll let some people starve and die, then they get anxious, and then they stop, and then they get anxious and stop. Whereas the other ones, they don't care. Like, if their whole population dies, so be it. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, like, we, we talk about the two major conflicts, right? Like the Israel one and the Ukraine one, but then there's also other ones springing up, like in the Dominican Republic. Yeah. And uh, Venezuela is going to invade Guyana and take two-thirds of their land, you know? And it's just... It is a wild time. It is, it is a very wild time, and I think brings us back to the grounding and kind of what we started talking about, resilience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I like that you use that word. I feel like I have some of it just based on my upbringing. I try to instill it in my kids and hope that they will instill it in your kids. I know you try to instill it in your kids, mm -hmm. right, with the life that we give them. So maybe that's the lesson from this from this episode. It's how do you focus on resilience? We as human beings will always disagree. We'll, we'll always escalate because that's what we do. We always feel like we don't have enough. And that's why the communism didn't work. But through all of that, how do we balance that with resilience and make sure that resilience is still more important than all of those other things? Well, uh, resilience is almost a... Uh it's almost a byproduct of suffering. Yeah. You know, like <clears throat> scrappy versus stretchy is something that I just recently listened to a podcast about. It's a book a guy wrote. And if you think about it, uh, scrappy and stretchy means this. Uh, no, sorry. Hold on. Chase. Sorry. 
chasey and stretchy. Sorry. Stretchy is making do with what you have, the suffering and the resilience. You'll come up with things. You built this incredible studio. You didn't just go buy all the stuff. You physically made it. Chasey is wanting and acquiring things. Mm. And they say that it's the yin to the yang, that none of us are one or the other. We are both at different times, days, minutes, points in our life. But it comes back to that. How do you teach the stretchiness? Yeah. Because the chasiness will come out on its own, always. You right. Don't, you don't have to teach that. <laughs> Society seems to be a pretty good teacher of that. Uh, of the chasiness. And I thought it was kind of interesting because uh, the, this company that I just joined, that was one of the things we were discussing. And I thought it was, it was pretty interesting how that comes into play in your life. Yeah. I, I just, uh, I don't know how a good way to go about that is. I mean, you have little examples that you can do every once in a while with your kids to to help that along but uh, you really the resilience is it's it's overcoming something and it's yeah. dealing with something terrible and it's it's dealing with hard times and we want to stay away from that you know we want to stay away from hard times it's just human nature you know and you know what they say uh uh hard times make strong men strong men make Good times, good times make weak men, and weak men makes makes a hard times. Yeah, you know, and That's a good point. and it's um, you it, become quite the philosopher, by the way. Ah, you're too kind. You know, I uh, well pontificating I've, and all. I've had the luxury of thinking deep. There you go. <laughs> Clearly, not being raised in a <laughs> communist Soviet <Yeah>. environment. <laughs> but you know, it's it's just I don't know, I don't know where society goes from from here. You know, or you talk about society, do you mean like American society, human society, Western society? Interplanetary society. Interplanet. We're getting there. You know, you're going to need to use that Klingon uh, blade at some point. Well, I could either use that one or I'll use the, uh, the gun blade there if things there get go. too dicey. Oh, my God. Yeah, there you go. Jesus. <laughs> you know, you can't go, uh, you cannot walk five feet in this garage without being with an arm's reach of a sword. It's designed that way. I see. Only so, in the garage, though. Only in the garage. Well, yeah, only in the garage. The, <laughs> I have a three-year-old, so I really I really wish Curves I could do it inside. problematic but, in the house, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and she gets into everything. Yeah. Um, you know, the other day, I turned my head, and she has makeup in her hair. You know, she's... Your makeup, obviously. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> my rouge. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you can't turn your back on these kids for more than a minute, you know, and I try to bribe the older one to watch the younger one, but that never works and still costs me money because they promised it. You know, it's but it is, you know, hard to kind of instill that, you know, I mean, I mean, I think it's on us, all of us, right, to find small ways to instill it. And, you know, sometimes it may mean learning, learning disappointment early friend of mine said that years ago mm. like how do you teach disappointment early everyone needs to be disappointed in order to appreciate yeah what i've yeah and it's certainly the earlier the better yeah you know because no you can't have ice cream from the ice cream man today you know what we're a little bit on a budget right now and it's just not something we can do let's go bake something at home mm-hmm. with the ingredients we have as silly as that little sample is, and maybe that and, you know that child at that point in time is going to cry because they see other kids getting it and they can't. Mm-hmm. But guess what? At some point in our lives, we were denied things because probably we couldn't afford it, and maybe we weren't even told that, that was the reason. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, definitely. Because I mean, my mom was a single mom. We grew up in Richmond, and you know, it was like, hey, I, I want, I want this Han Solo figure. You know, like. Uh, no, you can't get that right now, no. you know? And, and there was not necessarily, you, you wouldn't, I'm sure you weren't always able to connect that to funds. Well, but sometimes maybe you could. So <laughs> it, it ended up being like, okay, well, you have to go spend your own money on it then. So then it was a different problem. Now I'm in the toy aisle for like an hour and a half trying to see like what the best choice is for the $5 that I'm going to spend. And it's like, do I get this? Oh, I could get two of these. Ooh, but I don't really want, I only want one. And but I really want this one, you know? And like, that was a half hour, or an hour. And my mom's like, Josh, we need to go. Like, you, you're just not going to get anything at this point. And so it was like, I didn't get anything because I spent an hour and a half trying to decide, 
You know, because when it's my own money, you cared a, you cared a lot more yeah. about what you were going to do with it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it, and it comes back to the silly example I gave you, my grandmother planning the output from a factory. Mm-hmm. If you had a jacket and you knew that you literally couldn't go to the store and buy another one, you're going to take incredible care of that jacket. Yeah. Were there yeah. like, were so where were the farmers if everybody was coming and farming? Did they just... There was farming. I mean, I think there just probably wasn't enough people. Because it wasn't a, an attractive... Cultural. Yeah, position. you know what? I'm not sure why. It's a good point. I don't know why, but I guess, yeah, there just was not enough people doing that type of work. Or I mi- think I think Industrial Revolution brought a lot of people to cities. Yeah. And I'm assuming in you know in the Soviet Union as well. And maybe life was just too difficult in the farming communities because remember, everything was controlled mm-hmm. and not in your favor. Here, right. if you're a farmer, we'll subsidize you financially in some way so you can afford to still be a farmer. Over there... I'm just making this up. Let's say they paid a kopeck per whatever the item was. That wasn't a subsidized amount. That was just all you made. And maybe it was just very difficult to sustain that lifestyle. Right. And I'm sure, and look, some people did, obviously. Russia is a massive physical country, right? Not everyone lives in the cities, mm-hmm. but there clearly wasn't enough farming, right, for them to do that, for them to pull people from the cities and actually force them, force labor. Yeah. Once a year for six for a month to go and, and do that work. I you, they still paid you as an engineer, as a lawyer, as a doctor, whatever. It's oh, not like really? they paid you less. You still made your same salary. You just did a different job for that month. Because I was because when you mentioned that, I was like, well, what did the farmers do? Did they let them be go be a doctor for a month? You know, like or go be a lawyer or engineer for a month? And like that's a kick ass life for a yeah. farmer. Hey, you you, know? uh, you pick strawberries today. You're performing open heart surgery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry in advance, buddy. <laughs> Got any last words? Yeah, I was going to say, you want medical care? That's all you're going to get today. <laughs> Nurse, butter knife. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, it's... Um, I can't imagine... Like, So your parents had to go and, and pick the pick food? Pick the strawberries or the tomatoes or potatoes or whatever they had to go pick, yeah. So was the mentality just like, I'm picking this, and then it's just like, man, fuck this. Hmm? Yeah, it was. It really was because you didn't stand to gain anything from this. It wasn't like, well, if you did a better job than other people, somehow somebody would notice that and you would somehow be promoted in your regular job. It was thank, literally thankless work. It was just, you want to live? You don't want to be executed? That's what you do. Jeez. You know, which is, which is kind of crazy when you, when you think about it at that level. Because, you know, when we think about the Soviet Union, and this is going way back, right, into the 40s and 50s when Stalin was running that country, people disappeared literally all the time. You know, we still don't know how many tens, tens of millions Stalin killed of his own people. Right. I mean, yeah, it's communism is the deadliest form of government that there's ever been. I mean, look at, look at Mao. You know, he, Same thing. he just told Stalin, hold my beer. You know, like, watch this. And it was even almost, I think it was even worse. It may be worse. I mean, the population was even bigger. So we just, there's no, there's no, there's no information that ever made it out, right? They must have destroyed everything. And I don't think they were like the Germans. I don't think they were meticulous with the records. Yeah. <laughs> when, um, when you got out, so like that first initial, uh, maybe it was a, fl- you said it was a train. It was a train rush. So yeah. that initial train from... Was it from Ukraine to... Yeah, from Ukraine to what is now Czech Republic, and then on to Austria, and then eventually Italy. So, but was the Czech Republic, were they part of the USSR? Yeah. And so you were... So Only you until were, we got to Austria were we out of the actual Soviet Union. So that, that, that trip from the Czech Republic to Austria, did you have to like... I mean, you have, must have had to like... Because they didn't want to let people out, right? No, I mean, we had a visa, right? At that point, we were allowed to leave. Oh. As unhappy maybe as they were, because they you know, they would prefer for you to stay and make your life difficult. Yeah. Um, but the way they got us back, you know, there's always a backstory. My grandparents on my mom's side were supposed to leave with us. Everything was planned. They were packed. At the last moment, they, they canceled my grandparents' visas. And made them stay for a year before they let them out. Oh. After they had quit their jobs, packed up all their belongings. Wow. Yeah. At the last moment possible. That was their final FU. 
Well, because that's all that they could. That's the, basically their only recourse. You know, I mean, I mean, they could have just prevented us from leaving, but they hated us, so they weren't. You know, like leave. We're happy if you leave, but we're going to make it even that difficult for you. Yeah, because well, your your parents didn't you say your parent well, your uh, engineers? Engin- Both of my parents were engineers in in Russia because that was the profession that they were allowed to pursue. So there, but they couldn't have been happy about losing two engineers. You would think, no. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how that society thought, right? I mean, it was all planned output of everything. And, yeah. and the, I don't even know what my parents actually did as engineers, to be honest with you. I don't think we ever had deep conversations. I mean, my dad was a structural engineer, so something to do with building something, designing. Uh-huh. My mom was electrical, so something to do with designing electrical, but I have no idea what they actually worked on. Wow. No idea. I mean, maybe it was maybe it was... You know, civilian, maybe it was military. I literally have no idea. You, you've been back since, right? No. You've never been back? been back? My dad and my sister, who was born here, went back. My sister's actually married to a Russian guy who came from Russia, from one of the republics. Um, we, we were thinking about going back at some point, like pre-COVID. And then COVID hit. Then this war is hit. Yeah. And I would say probably the last six years, we would have considered going. And obviously, you know, now is not the time. Right. And I mean, if you even if you go back, it's probably going to be a lot different than what you remember. I, I, I don't even think. Yeah, I, I honestly, my memories are so small, right, relative to what it looks like now. I mean, I was a kid, right? The viewpoint of everything is like looking up at the world, right? Sure. And that's all I remember. You know, like I said, I didn't even go to school. So I don't even have memories of like going to school and carrying a bag and... Having a notebook, right? I don't have any of those memories at all. Those are all memories based in the U.S. All I remember is I came here and my knowledge of the English language was limited to like mom, dad, cat, dog, you know, just <laughs> the real, real basics. Sure. And I had to go to, into an ESL program, right, for, for kids that don't speak English well for like at least a year, you know, to try to figure out how to speak the language. And it was, you know, as a kid, you're pretty, again, resilient. Yeah. <laughs> You pick it up fairly fast. I think it was a bit more challenging for my parents. They somehow found jobs as engineers relatively quickly and maybe just because we needed engineers and they thought Russian engineers are probably good. But imagine even as engineers trying to communicate in a professional English, not just colloquial English. Right. I'm sure it wasn't easy for them. They weren't talking about cats and dogs. They're talking about specific terminology for right. you know what I mean? whatever they're designing and I'm sure my dad or my mom would be like, hold on a second, dictionary, hold on a second, dictionary. <laughs> well, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of like a big benefit of technology today is you can talk into your phone. Like the, the guy who's talking to you yeah. about the Russian uh, guy that was here, yeah. he didn't really speak that great of English. And so, oh, wow. you know, we were here for probably like an hour and change, but, you know, the episode's only about 37 minutes long because yeah. he was, you know, trying to translate on his phone. And it was like, it took forever for us to get the word denazification i was like well what is that you know and he was and i would it's just such a weird word we take nazi (laughs) out (laughs) but you know like you can talk into a phone now and it will and it's only getting better exponentially i mean you're in you're in ai now that's right so it's only a matter of time before that gets uh integrated into some kind of translator and it it's basically There'll be a, will there be a universal Unmet. language, Josh? Are we are we heading towards a universal language with all of us? We're speaking it. There we go. We're speaking it now. There we go. <laughs> are, are we saying that the languages of the world and the interplanetary world will come together in one common language, and whatever we say won't matter because the output is going to come in this universal language that whatever you're using is going to accept and translate to you? Yeah, it's... Um, so that kind of thing, what I, I don't know how you'd get around is like, not everything means the same thing in different languages, you know, like, of course, of course, and we'll, we'll be offending each other quite often. Right. Yeah. Which is I'm looking a, forward to. Is that to. bad? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I'm not disappointed about that at all. Actually, that looks like that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. And, but you know, it's a lot of times it's context too, you know, and, and with, I've heard like in the Korean language, um, you talk to somebody different. Uh, based off of a status, like the age, mm-hmm. you know, like, and I don't really know how that factors in, you know, and of course, uh, Spanish, it has male and female 
That's true. Con- you know, connotations to each word. And nah, that is all very true. You're right. Yeah. I mean, I just don't, I'm not sure how it works, but you know, there's people that are smarter than me on this. <laughs> so, and you trust them. I do. I, I do. you know, um, you're either going to make it easier, make my life slightly easier, or you're going to initiate Skynet and doom us all. No, so which is a communist principle. <laughs> have you seen, cause they actually do have, uh, the drones now that look just like, uh, those like flying little helicopter things in oh, Terminator yeah. Yeah, yeah. with missiles on them and, you know, little Gatling guns. Well, you know what the Ukrainians were doing is they were taking, um, not what's it called? Uh, small aircraft, like the kind of aircraft you would fly. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you call that kind of aircraft? Non-commercial, whatever. Like a, like a single seat or like a, like a single engine. Yes. Yeah, simple, yeah. like the most inexpensive aircraft and converting them to drones. And that's what they were using for long range hits into Russia. Mm. They invented their own when, when they couldn't get it from us. Right. I mean, you know, you, World War II was fought with uh, like battleships and artillery and, you know, the, in, the, a lot of planes, but mm-hmm. World War III is going to be fought with drones, lasers, robots, uh, robots, you know, and it's just, you know, we thought that World War III was going to be a nuclear war and it, that would be end. Yeah. We didn't realize what's coming. Yeah. And it's like, oh no, there's something else that you really haven't thought of yet. And it's, it's wild, you know, like we used it a lot. We use a lot of drones in Afghanistan and, and like that. But now that's more reconnaissance, individual hits versus like full on warfare. right? Yeah. Well, they have, you know, they had the Reaper drones that's and true. you remember, I'm, um, I mean, I, I feel like in the pre 2010s and tw- like that was a pretty popular way to, to kill people, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. Um, but they still required human control, right, right? For the most part, right. We're we're very close to fully autonomous, which is a, that's a dangerous game to play, yeah. yeah. You know, because all that thing has to do is think, oh, humans want no wars, so no humans, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like uh, th- there's got to be yeah. some kind of safety written in there about that. Yeah, you're right. I just, I just. Let's don't hope know. it's not programmed by a Chinese or an Iranian programmer. <laughs> well, that's why we, um, you know, I all my electronics in here, I made sure to get from Japan. Oh wow! Not nice. China. Nice. Yep. So, uh, you know, that's our Asian friend now. Well, for all you know, assembled in Japan. True. You know, but actually, I manufactured that, in. <laughs> uh, well, a lot of the uh, a lot of the manufacturing is moving away from China and I into know. Mexico now. Mexico and Vietnam and some of these yeah. other countries, yeah. And Mexico's quality is a lot higher than China's. Oh, really? Yeah, and oh. the, their labor is um Wouldn't wouldn't cheaper. know it by the... <laughs> what are you talking about? They're top-notch. I, this will be edited out. The best. The best. <laughs> Just kidding. Just um, kidding. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's parts of this show you're going to go, eh, eh. <laughs> You know, I always say that I'll cut things out, but I don't. You know, so, ah, but you know, you feel one way when you're producing mm-hmm. one way when you're recording it, a different way when you're producing it. Right. Cause you're trying mm-hmm. to get a certain message out. Right. Yeah, the that, the day, and you want to make sure that you know, there's stuff. I'm sure you and I, we went on some tangents that not necessarily related to what our initial topic was and it's fine, but then mm-hmm. you may set it back. Okay. Maybe I'll leave one or two tangents in there, but I still want a theme. Yeah. I, I, I feel like the tangents make it more, you might say tangible. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just, it builds a little extra layer of, uh, we're real people, That's true. you know, and this isn't like a scripted or choreographed interview. No, this was, this was honestly fantastic. I love the fact that we just talked. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. I mean, we should do it again. We should do it again. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to make you bring your whole rig set up to Redwood City. <laughs> you told me it's portable, the table. I saw it's got wheels. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it doesn't have a motor yet. Ah, okay. Or seats. Oh. So, I, Well, actually, it does have seats, but... You do uh, remember I specialize in crates. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'll bring this crate down. There we go. There but, we go. All right, Steve. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Likewise, Josh. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Of course. All right. All right, see you guys. See you.